Thank you. All right, I got my like fence, and I'm good. <laughs> my playpen. Okay, cool. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, like he said, I'm um, I'm co-founder of Twin Engine Labs. We have about ten guys that work for us, and and we do uh, we do apps. Um, this is uh, we're called Twin Engine Labs because we're identical twins. Uh, I have no idea which one's which in this picture at all. Like I. <laughs> My mom doesn't know. We, she didn't write it down on the back of the picture. Like, none of us know. But it's a great example of why we're, uh, it's twin engine. So, um, and uh, Keith and I are really serious, very serious guys about working on apps. So, um, but uh, we both, uh, we complement each other. Um, and uh, we've worked together in the industry for about seven years. Uh, and he's an engineer. While I'm a designer, he does all the heavy muscle on the back end stuff. And then I handle any marketing and imagery. So, um, so we recently, uh, we've, we've done a, quite a few projects. Um, and I think most of us, most people know us from being the tech muscle behind uh, Morse Less More. Um, but as an agency, we take anything that, uh, that will come into the shop. And so we work on things that, um, all the way from children's books to, uh, you know, waiting room apps to Cisco CRM Salesforce stuff. Um, and What's neat is that uh, we finally got the chance to work on our own thing uh, where we really had no, no holds barred. And uh, we'd been trying to do it for forever, but as a shop, it's difficult to make that work with the money guy. <laughs> um, there has to be that revenue coming in, covering those guys working on the project, and so it's very difficult to do your own thing. Uh, we finally worked out the math and the, the right sort of profit margins and things to be able to shut the shop down every Friday, work on whatever we wanted to work on. Um, the first Friday, we actually had a big LAN party, uh, <laughs> just to kind of kick off the right attitude. So it's not working on Friday, it's fun Friday. And it's, it's some sort of project that matters to you. Um, so Pinnacle Hill was born, and Pinnacle Hill comes from a game called um, League of Legends. Uh, is anybody familiar with that at all? Um, OK, so it's nice. Camera guy, awesome. <laughs> um, so League of Legends is, is uh, 32 and a half million registered users last year. Uh, in November. So uh, to give you an idea, World of Warcraft, which probably everybody's heard of because they have a great marketing team, they actually have 11 million users. So they're eclipsing them by quite a bit. Um, the game is, um, it, it has uh, professional esports tournaments with massive crowds the worldwide. Um, they have million dollar rewards. Um, and, and it's incredibly deep. It is a very chess-like game. You can learn it very quickly. Um, but to master it, it becomes very difficult. So they actually have um, 11 and a half million monthly users. And at any given time, in any 24-7 period, you can see 1.3 million users connected at the exact same time. Um, so at that, at that kind of juncture, you can look at um, the data behind having 10 and a half million users a day, or 10 and a half million hours played every day. So and this infographic that they put up, um, says uh, there were Vikings back then, right? So it's, uh, it's near uh, 1,197 years a day is played in this game. Um, we had no idea. We fell in love with it because it's the only game that would run on my piece of crap laptop that I brought in to play at the LAN party, right? <laughs> so everybody played that game, and we had a lot of fun. We all fell in love with it. Um, but it is extremely difficult to really get good at. Um, and, uh, and the more we played publicly and with friends, the more we lost, and so we started trying to get better. Now this stuff right here on the right is things that you have to know about every champion that you want to play, and there are hundreds of champions that go into each match, right? So these are all things you have to know, and this, this game is, is, is a blast, but it's extremely difficult. So uh, we're tinkers and hackers, and we, we wanted to fix something which was um, essentially us being bad at the game, um, and so uh, we went to these websites like Mobifier, and we would look at these guides, and our first prototype was all of us just using our phones while we were playing the game by taking a picture of the website and flipping through our photo album. <laughs> um, and it was frustrating and slow and difficult, but it proved that it worked for us, and we were able to like, learn champions much faster than we were used to. Um, so. So eventually, that turned into an HTML5 prototype. Um, that's something that I can do sitting down, not waiting for an engineer, not tying up any of their time. I designed it, cut it up, turned it into an app, and then pushed it to our web server. 
Now, the devs picked it up, and they played with it, and they broke it in like three minutes, right? Because that's what they like to do. And then they, they tore it apart experience-wise, and they said, this is terrible. This will never, ever get us anywhere. This is such a chug experience. It's very slow, right? The browser just haven't quite caught up for me to do what I was trying to do, because I'm essentially loading 100 different characters' data into one website at the same time, right? Um, so in three days, they rebuilt what I did in like weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, they got together, they worked all night on it, and, and they came up with this sort of informational app. Um, everybody does informational apps for their favorite games, if they're an app maker. One man band guys, they, they handle this in their garage, and they push it out there, and they make a few bucks, and, and they never update it again, right? And so that was one of the big frustrating parts. I could have probably downloaded an app without making an HTML5 counterpart, but none of the apps actually kept up to date with all the new stuff that comes out. This, this game pushes new content every two or three weeks. Um, and so oftentimes, Apple's restrictive policies make it so that when you push an app to that app store, uh, these one-man band shops that don't have these huge back-end servers and these things that we were trying to do, um, they have to go back in and manually update everything and try and keep up with Riot Games, the company behind the game. So the first thing we did was drive it with the server, right? So we're never ever gonna have to come back to this thing and manually type any information ever again. Uh, we actually update faster than Riot updates their own servers. Um, and we don't ever do it manually. That's the key point. <laughs> um, so, so Keith said, get this thing off the ground. It's pretty. We're getting great feedback. Everybody says it looks gorgeous. They want to register. We have way too many beta testers for our own good. Get out there and make it really noisy. Um, and as Keith's right-hand man, I became the marketing department. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we, uh, we did a lot of similar things like they were talking about in the last episode, or the last talk which was go straight to social channels and, and do community management and, um, and get on you know, front of Reddit and all that stuff, right? So, um, and and it, it got a lot of attention. Um, but one thing that I started seeing when I was researching was this second stream stuff, and it was incredible. Um, and that's really, that's my goal to talk about tonight. I'm not gonna try and sell you Pinnacle, okay? Um, the, the cool thing is like, uh, Disney is really doing these second screen stuff. Now, it wasn't, um, I was pretty unimpressed as a guy that hangs out with a bunch of really brilliant devs all day, but the tech was cool, and it got us all thinking, right? So um, John Carter is a good example. Um, now, they, they have the ability and the capabilities in some of the newer stuff to let you check into locations of the episode, which is kind of, uh, I don't know. You know, that's neat. I don't know if I want to check into Mars on, on Facebook, but that's, that's cool. I'm a fan of John Carter, so uh, I might do that. Um, but they also will show you like an audio-driven journal um, where John actually talks you through it. And then uh, they also, uh, the main thing that they do is they sync the audio with the iPad app. This is cool tech, right? This made me start thinking. Um, but they sync the audio with the iPad so that, um, wait for it, it drives a slideshow. Ugh, what a letdown, right? <laughs> so um, as I dug more and more, though, I said, this is a really big thing. And it's starting to take off. And Google was even digging into researching it, right? Um, and so. Then I fell on Xbox, and they're doing everything right. They're crushing it with this. So what they realize is that everybody's playing their games with their own handheld devices in their hands all the time. Um, and so they created Halo Atlas. Uh, and, and Halo Atlas was the precursor to Smart Glass. And Smart Glass is going to be on every single device. And they're really crushing it where we and PlayStation aren't, because we and PlayStation create their own hardware. You don't take that hardware to work with you, and you don't take it to the grocery store, and you don't take it on your date that's going bad, and you don't do any of that stuff. <laughs> you don't do that, right? You're not carrying the Wiimote around with you, okay? So, so it's on your phone. And you can look at it at any time, and you can be completely engaged in an app, in a game, or in content that you're nowhere near, right? Um, so the coolest part is the Atlas. And what they were doing was they were building this, um, this really amazing tech way back when Xboxes started really taking off. And, and they had this thing called a heartbeat, and it would just talk to the server. Every few games, it would talk to the server and update your stuff online. Well, some guys got together and said, let's just crank that heartbeat up. Let's do it so that we have a GPS, a real-time GPS. And so now, when you're playing the game, you can actually see all your friends and their positions and the spawn points and the waypoints and where the last guy was killed. And this is incredible information to anybody that wants to competitively play this, right? Now, you can't use this in a tournament. It's a huge advantage. Um, but what you can do in a tournament is see where you are and see the map as a whole. Um, 
if you're playing with friends in a custom match, then you can actually see uh, health packs, spawn points, weapons, information. You can tap any of those things to get the stats before the game. Um, you can actually create games from this to join in later. Um, your friends can message you and show you their latest uh, creation, et cetera, et cetera. And so I went back to Keith and I said, let's not release it yet, right? And I, and I begged the engineers to stay with me and hang in there and to make one more really cool feature. And so one of the things, we were, we were getting better. We were actually getting better as, as teammates and, and a lot of our fans would, would play with us and, and they would just... Um, they would just kick our ass all night long, right? And, but they would tell us what we were doing wrong. And so we were getting better, and we started learning about counterpicking, right? Um, now, this is competitive play. Uh, and what you see on the laptop screen right there is um, uh, my team picks, their team picks, my team picks, their team picks, my team picks, their team picks. And so what, what ends up happening, and there's a whole mess of psychology involved with this, but when you pick, and then they pick, the next guy underneath you needs to be looking at that champion and how to counter him, right? And, and it's actually, there's lots of websites that do this. You just type in the champion name and it tells you the top five by, based on the crowd resources, but it takes forever and you have, you have 30 seconds to make these decisions. And a lot of time there's a lot of chatter going on in that chat room that you want to pay attention to. Um, so every time I did it and I tried to counter somebody, I basically would blow the time frame, right? And, and I would randomly be picked and it would just, it was terrible. And, and, Whole team hated me for it, and it was bad. So, <laughs> so, so I was like, guys, uh, is there any way that we can use the phones to make these counter picks, right? And so the engineers all got together, and they did this really brilliant shit where they did this second screen technology, and they said, this is all driven with art. Everything in this entire game is driven with art. And there is frameworks. There's so many frameworks now that recognize images. Um, it's not like a QR code we need. We don't need black dots. We can actually look at art and it knows what it's looking at. And then so that combined with some server work and you, you get real time data based on a three second scan, right? So we hold this thing up to the champion right after they pick it and it even works as they're flipping through cards of people, right? Um, and it just queues up all this information for you to look at. And it says, these are the top five champions that the crowd says beat this person, right? And if you play one of these guys, you'll have a huge advantage over that person. So um, the other thing we did was we took that same tech and the loading screen is driven with art and we scanned the champions with it, right? And so at that point it tells you the gameplay mechanics and the items that will beat that champion, okay? So, uh, and that was somewhere we could show you a lot more information because you're hanging out on that loading screen for sometimes five minutes at a time, which is super long in game time. So. Um, so to test it, we shut down the shop, we played 24 hours in one night, and, and we filmed the whole thing with uh, Fairfield, and, uh, and we, we tried to beat our, our fans again. Now, our fans still beat us, but we actually did a lot better this time around. Um, so this is where it's scanning, and you, it just uses the camera, and, and it scans, and it cues everything up, and then when I hit that done button, it actually opens up a screen with tons of information about the, every champion that I'm about to go against. Uh, it's, uh, it, for me, mostly it just helps with the pregame jitters. That's it. It doesn't actually make me really good because I'm not even close to really good. But uh, the, the more competitive players that we've had using the app actually really enjoy using it. Um, so, um, you know, all that's really cool, and, and I'm a big fan of technology that's cool, but uh, I, I need it to make sense in a business term so that I can get my brother to let me keep playing video games at work, right? <laughs> so. So, and now this is all scraped from Google. I did not create these graphics, but it is extremely compelling information. Um, and I've gone ahead and short-coded it for you guys if you want to look at the report. It's, uh, at, it's at bit.ly uh, slash Google second screen. Um, now, what they've done is they've watched a sampling, a huge sampling of people over the last few years, and they've seen that 90% of all media interactions are actually on multiple screens. That unfortunately means, because I am uh, a big fan of journalism, um, that unfortunately means though that print is, is pretty quickly being the last place that we go to for our media. Uh, it's, 10, it's only 10% at this point. So now, after eight hours of our hard work day, we go home and do four and a half additional hours in front of screens, okay? Uh, just under four and a half. So, um, and that's just our leisure time. We're having fun doing that. We're consuming media because we want to at that point, right? So there's three different ways that people actually use um, use these uh, multiple screens at the same time. One is sequential, where I, I have uh, an, an idea, a need, and so I open my phone and I go and I do something, right? Uh, and then I finish it later 
um, on a laptop or on an iPad or a television. Um, and, and what's neat is 96% of people that do this uh, actually finish the interaction in the same day. So that's really important to people that are interested in selling things. Um, the other one is complementary usage. So complementary usage is um, I, it augments uh, what I'm doing on my phone while it's on the website. Um, it's extremely difficult to pull off, and not a lot of people are doing it. And then um, finally is multitasking. When is the last time you've sat through a presentation and not pulled your phone out and looked at it, right? <laughs> so, or when have you ever watched a TV episode and not Googled something that you needed to know about that actor? Or a movie where you had no idea what the person is and your girlfriend leans over to you and says, who is that? And you don't know. So you look it up to seem cool, right? So um, all those things happen. Um, what happens most, though, is sequential. Um, and this means that uh, when people are out and about with their phones, they're crushing all of these things all day long and then finishing up later, right? Um, so what's neat is 65% of those always phone, almost always. Um, and so it, the majority, it, the phone is the backbone at this point, right? 67% um, of even PC usage is done using a phone or an iPad with it. 45% uh, of it is, is smartphones. So, um, and then the neat thing is smartphone usage period is really spontaneous, right? So it's, uh, it's actually 80% of people using their smartphone are doing it because they just felt like doing it at that moment. Um, and that's important because we're all really impulsive. And 44% of people of those 80% are doing it because they needed to accomplish a specific task, like buy something, right? Um, and the good news is that 81% um, are spur of the moment shoppers on mobile phones. So we're talking about a huge, massive audience of people that are impulse buying stuff. This is great. <laughs> um, this is great to anybody creating media or apps or games or any digital content or even short films. This is important because they're pulling their phones out dealing with it at the same time, right? Um, so this changes everything that we know about as far as interaction with media, right? Um, our marketing channels are extremely diverse now. There is no traditional versus untraditional. Um, and then there's also, um, there's also, uh, experiences needing to be uh, passed around from device to device. Like I need to be able to put something in a shopping cart on my phone and then pay for it later because typing a credit card is way hard on this little tiny keyboard, right? Um, the other thing is uh, conversion goals are crazy now. So you can't just funnel somebody to the website and call it a sale, right? Uh, that thing came from way, uh, so many other devices at this point. Um, and it probably started on one and ended on another. So you don't, it's all, it's all, all your statistics are pretty disjointed at this point and people are having to figure out how to merge these, this data. Um, the other thing, too, is that finally, like I was saying earlier, smartphones are really the backbone here, and that's the starting place most people start on when they go to uh, do additional shopping or research about your media creation. Um, and so, uh, you know, the last thing that I want to say, and, and really kind of, I want to plant the seed of the second screen technology, right? So think about it when you're doing your next cool thing, uh, when you're doing your documentary or you're doing your your game, or you're doing your digital art, or your music. Um, what can you do with this, these extremely powerful devices? So these things have cameras that can recognize images. They have speakers that can talk to this person and listen to them, right? Um, they have a 24-7 on network all the time. Um, they have voice recording. They have voice recognition. They have Bluetooth. They have forward. They have GPS, <laughs> they have push notification, which means that you're relevant all the time to them because you get to tell them, hey, I vibrated your phone and let you know that we just finished something for you to look at, right? Um, and then it's 24-7 access to their social media. So uh, ultimately, when you're creating your next project, think about smartphones. It's the backbone of the initial experience. And really what I want to know is, is what will you guys create out of it? Ultimately, our goal at Twin Gen Labs is to create a big platform for indie game developers to be able to quickly and easily push information to the phones so that they can create apps out of it. Um, that is many, many years away that my really uh, uh, time-conscious brother told me to make sure that you guys knew that that's not going to come out anytime soon. But um, we're also very happy to see somebody beat us to it because we really want to just be able to have mobile devices involved with more media. Um, so, so that's it. Um, that is the main idea there, and uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.